So I'm not gonna kick things off with my usual preamble because we have so much to get to today. First things first, if you do not know what this is or why it's important, clearly you have been living under a rock, need to get out more often. And then second, this, it's not one of these vehicles that we can talk about output figures and then scream up and down the hill and call it a day. This, it's not just important for Land Rover and the Defender name. This is a pivotal point in automotive history. And for us to do it justice, We've got to do a tech review, an on-road first drive review, and then an off-road first drive review. Not something we could cover in just one episode. So today, you and I are gonna do a combo tech review, an on-road first drive review, and then in the future, we are going to do what this was designed to do, and as God intended, go off-road. Kicking things off, there are two engines on offer, a four-cylinder and a six-cylinder. The car you and I are driving today is going to be the six-cylinder, so only high-level numbers on the two-liter turbocharged four-cylinder, 296 horsepower, 295 pound-feet of torque. Now, whether it's a six or a four, they are both 48-volt mild hybrid systems, very similar to the AMG 53s we've driven. However, the difference here, the integrated starter generator motor does not sit between the engine and the transmission. Instead, there is an accessory drive in this system, and the integrated starter generator motor sits in the accessory drive, provides assist to the engine. There is no alternator in this system. And that brings us to the output of this six-cylinder, 395 total system horsepower, 406 pound-feet of torque. Now, whether it's a four or a six-cylinder, any transmission you want, as long as it's an eight-speed automatic. You and I have driven this transmission before in other brands. It's the ZF unit with a torque converter. Now, how does all of this, two propulsion systems in this very flash 48-volt mild hybrid, translate to figures that you and I could use? I would argue that this being a large SUV, towing is probably the most important, and that's just a shade over 8,600 pounds. And then there's the weight, the shortest, the two-door 90 model. That's just a hair over 4,800 pounds. This five-door model with kind of a lot of stuff in it is 5,165 pounds. Translated, that's 2,342 kilos. As such, zero to 60 is somewhat surprising. It's 5.8 seconds in this one. If it were the four cylinder, it'd be 7.7 .7 seconds. This one has a VMAX of 129 miles an hour. That is a feeling of acceleration I have not experienced in a while. And you know what it reminds me of? A turbo diesel engine, like a very, very late model turbo diesel engine, something like a Mercedes or a BMW, in that there is not a lot of grunt when clearly the turbochargers are not spooling, but when you spool those turbochargers, there is grunt, meaning this engine is clearly geared more towards that of torque than high-end horsepower for acceleration. And the very unexpected and rather interesting byproduct of the way this engine is set up and the way it delivers power, it almost sounds like a turbo diesel engine while doing it. And now to the heart of the matter underneath the vehicle, which brings us to the elephant in the room, permanent four-wheel drive. Now notice I don't say all-wheel drive. Why don't I use the term all-wheel drive? Well, there is both a center locking differential as well as an active locking rear differential. That is backed up by double wishbones in the front and a multi-link unit in the rear. Those in turn are attached to completely new steel subframes. Now giving you a brief glimpse into what that means off-road, the suspension can articulate almost 20 inches and the vehicle can attack inclines up to 45 degrees. Of course, we gotta talk about the wheels which can be had in 18, 19, 20 and 22 inch diameters. Then the piece de resistance, which is the combo of the air ride and the programmable modes. Now what's not new here is the terrain response system too. That makes the jump from other Land Rovers. What is new with the Defender is two extra modes. The first being a configurable mode. Think of this as like radio presets for your off-road settings. And then the second mode is a waiting mode. And what that does 
it raises the vehicle height to the highest point, turns on the recirculation of the HVAC system, changes the throttle mapping to make it less responsive, and then last but not least, locks the four-wheel drive system. Now that we understand all of that, I would argue the second biggest consideration, not just for me, but for Defendi Aficionados, is on-road driving dynamics. And here, very happy to report that this drives like an honest-to-goodness SUV. Uh, it does not drive like a crossover. It's got play in the steering wheel like a real SUV would have. I won't even bother with pit, squat, dive, and roll. There's plenty of that on offer. And yes, there's going to be that center of gravity issue if you drive it aggressively around town. And shocker of shockers, it drives like a Defender. So here's something unexpected. I don't need to share dimensions because the car will list them out for us. Instead, let's focus on what sets this apart and that arguably is the color and trim. Here, nothing short of brilliant. Like for example, the top of the dash, the top of the door panels, it's got a neoprene feel to it. Then the seat covers, they're leather, but the seating centers have this like nylon feel. I gather that's more for strength. Then if you look at the door panels, they do still have the exterior color, the metal, as part of the interior door panel. Then there's another touch that accents throughout the interior, and that would be the hex bolts. A rather industrial and unique touch, but I would argue it's somewhat reminiscent of lofts from like the early 80s in Soho, New York City. As a New Yorker, thank you very much. Then a couple of details I'm a sucker for, first being the dash panel. That's on offer in a couple of different finishes. Of course, there's an open pour satin finish wood. That I believe is only on offer in the fancy models like the X, which changes some of the trim on the outside as well as on the inside. However, what you see here, which is the SE, that's not painted, that's powder coated. Then the lighting of the vehicle. Yeah, the panoramic roof is very cool, but I love like the old school Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser type windows back here. And then second to last, I would like to call your attention to the floor. You will note A, no floor mats, B, no carpeting, C, rubberized, which means this is designed to be able to hose out at least the bottom of the vehicle when the car gets dirty. And now, the piece de resistance for the interior. Uh, there are different seating options on offer. What you are looking at is a five seat package, one, two, three, four, five. There is a five plus two, which is obviously what you see here, plus seats in the back. Then there is a six seat option. That is not this plus one seat in the back, that is two bench seats, meaning instead of two buckets, there is a bench seat in the front, which takes me back to Frankfurt last year when this car was first introduced. Yes, they had the 110 on display, but they had a 90, which means it's a three-door. It had no windows in the back, so it was like a delivery kind of vehicle. It had steel wheels, and it had a bench seat. Call me crazy, but that's the one I'd have. Steering and brakes are what you'd expect from a vehicle like this as we go into this turn here. There's a little bit of plow and dive in the front. I would argue the brakes are the bigger improvement here. So net net, nothing earth shattering in these two areas. Rather think of this as a massive upgrade in drivability. This is a balance of a retro design and a very modern design. I would argue it's very similar to a Porsche 911 Targa, and I'm not saying that because I'm a Porsche guy. You look at a 911 Targa, there is literally just a sliver of retro design, meaning the Targa bar mixed with a modern day Porsche. This is very similar. I would argue there's a couple of more retro touches here. Like for example, you look at the roof, or if you get to the back of the vehicle, and look straight down the side, the way it meets with the daylight opening, that is a carbon copy of Defenders from years past. Beyond that, there are a number of things going on. First and foremost, the overall design is significantly more muscular, specifically around the wheel openings, a huge departure from the Defender that came before it. Then there are a lot of details you don't notice in pictures or in video. You gotta see the car in person to understand them. Most of them work very well, like the details in the front or the rear, especially the taillights. One of them that does not work so well is that covering in the C-pillar. 
It looks like a piece of plastic just been tacked on. I would argue there was probably a better way to do that. And then two other things to throw in the mix. Like the interior, one of the very important parts that differentiates this design is the color and trim. Great example, the way they spell out Defender on the front of the vehicle, or the way they have the satin finish bumper in the front. And then last but not least, the proportions. You don't really understand how big the vehicle is until you see it in person, especially the 110. And I would argue the design makes the vehicle look smaller than it really is. g wagons Jeeps and Defenders, very challenging when it comes to ride quality because they are designed to go off-road. Uh, here, yes, better compliance in the ride quality here where you could push it maybe not aggressively around turns like this or aggressively around town and it will not disturb occupants. It won't be a very uncomfortable ride. Like here's a great way to describe it. It won't be one of those rather uncomfortable rides where you put your wife, grandmother, or girlfriend in your new Defender, your new G-Vog, and your new Jeep and you have to explain why you bought it. Here they'd be like, wow, sweetie, this drives very nice. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game of mine, the options game, and today will be an incredibly special round because what you are looking at is the debut of the Land Rover brand on our game. And this one is a very special Land Rover, the 2021 Land Rover Defender 110 SE for a base price of $62,250. Now I do need to point out two housekeeping items. Number one, the most basic Land Rover Defender can be had in the US for $46,100. And number two, you may have seen a couple of these floating around the US, not many because they got a very slow production start for obvious reasons, but you have not seen any 90s. And the reason why, those will not be in the US, really North America, until the actual calendar year of 2021. Now that we understand that, let's press on. Pangea Green, which I must say, I like. It's kind of a lighter green, but it's pretty cool looking. $710. Then the interior is called Khaki, Khaki, and Ebony. Clearly a three-tone, and that is free of charge. Then there's the roof. The contrasting color, at least to me, absolutely makes the design, and as such, I thought it was baked into the vehicle. Apparently, I was wrong because the white roof is an additional $870. While we're talking about the roof, the panoramic sunroof, which absolutely changes the interior of the vehicle, well worth it, $1,750. The tow hitch receiver, $650. 14-way heat and memory seat, $500. That sounds very cheap to me. My guess is that's just for the seat heating. And then what did we say the base price of this vehicle was? 62,000 and change. So YOY is a Sirius XM radio optional for $300. Then we move on to the driver's assistance package. This is a stop and go active cruise control for $1,020. To that, we add the cold climate package. This adds a lot of heating elements, the windscreen, the headlights, the washer jets, and the steering wheel, $700. Now this being a Defender, we have to add the advanced off-road capability pack, which consists of the all-terrain progress package, that terrain response control two unit we talked about in the suspension discussion, those four configurable modes for the terrain system, that is $735. And then last but not least, let's add yet another off-road package. This one rather important because it adds the E-diff in the rear, off-road tires, and then very curiously, the 110 power outlet in the back for $1,345. The only thing left to add is the destination and handling from the Midlands, $1,350 for a total retail price of $72,180. And with that, a bit of a tour. You will see very simple cockpit here. There are steering wheel controls that are lit up when the vehicle starts. Thankfully, there is a shifter in the center of the vehicle, but still is a compromise for those that want more space here. Note, cough, cough, AMG and other manufacturers that put it up here. And then this is really the star of the show. There are three knobs. Obviously, the most simple one is the knob here 
for the volume. And then there are two knobs here. Now you would think that they are just for the temperature. Turns out they have multiple uses. So if I were to press this down here, it's the heated and cooled seat. Press again, it goes back to temperature control. Then there are two buttons between the two knobs, one marked with the fan. You hit that, this rightmost knob becomes the fan speed controller. Ingenious, isn't it? Then I could hit that again, go back to temperature. Then there's yet another button on top of that that's marked with the car. That turns the leftmost knob into the control over the drive modes. Other OEMs, try and copy this. Perhaps I'm talking a bit out of school here, but this, it's good. I, I didn't expect to like it this much. Now I am going to reserve final judgment until you and I drive it together off-road in an upcoming episode. In the interim, I do need to leave you with a couple of things. First is that 48 volt electrical system. It's important here for the exact same reasons it's important in Ohl's Mercedes that we drive. Less moving parts will hopefully translate to better reliability, better longevity, and hopefully more efficiency over the total cost of ownership. Now, we can't answer that today. That's gonna to take a couple of years. Yet more important than that, this is an unequivocal triumph of design. This looks like nothing else on the road today. And keep in mind, the road today is nothing but a sea of SUVs. That is why, despite a global pandemic, worrisome unemployment numbers, and a worldwide recession, people are still lining up to buy these. Until I see you in the next episode, bis später.